Praise the Lord. One of the things that this brother that went to the ice cream parlor with me back in the year 1980 when I was in grammar school <laughs> is he didn't mention and what we want to do is always give glory to Christ, not a man is that God asked me, those of you that were there last night, remember, I asked him to stand. I told him he had diabetes. I told him his heart was diseased. And I told him that his kidneys were being damaged. The importance of that single fact is the mathematical, astronomical probability of those things. You can't do that. Don't try this at home. It was the power of Almighty God that healed him. Now let's give God the glory. Hallelujah. I'm uh, going to take a moment and ask you to close your eyes, if you will. We are entering a zone in this room right now where Christ, the Son of God, will begin to heal the sick. I'm going to preach, but I don't know how long, and God reserves the right to interrupt me at any time. But if you don't believe that miracles are real, and you sit there and say, my church tradition tells me that they stopped when the apostles died, then I want you to keep something in mind. God is sovereign, and that means he can do whatever he wants however he wants, to whoever he wants, whenever he wants. You say, Mara, if I don't believe in healing, God's not going to touch me. Don't count on it. You may be the first one healed, and you'll have a problem. I know that people say, well, if, if I don't have first the gift of faith, God won't heal me. I have seen unsaved people healed. People that didn't believe in healing healed. And by the way, Lazarus was dead when he was healed. He didn't believe anything. So the power of God is greater than your emotions and your life. And he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. In Jesus' name, amen. Clap your hands, everybody. Give God the glory. How many of you are hungry for a word from God? You want the word of God, do you? A word from God. Last night, I asked a very burning question of the audience. I'm going to ask it because two-thirds of you weren't there. How many of you have heard a prophetic word spoken over the tri-cities that revival was coming? If you raise your hand right now. How many of you heard that word from a source that you trust? Raise your hand. How many of you believe that that was a word from God? Now I'm here to tell you that God doesn't talk like that without acting. How many of you believe revival is coming to the Tri-Cities? Hallelujah, man, I feel something right now. The Lord sent me back here after three decades. That's how long of a gap it's been since I was here. I don't know what I did wrong. But somebody held a grudge for over 30 years. But the fact is that you are entering these three days of fasting and prayer for a reason that is way bigger than you understand. I don't think that you folks that are here today are here by accident. There's no advertisement out in front of this church that said you were going to get something free. This was not a sale today. This was not a swap meet. 
You came because you are hungry for revival. You want and believe in the supernatural. It would be silly for me to preach a sermon to try to convince you that we need healing or revival. You're already there. So I want to preach a sermon if I can. Hello to some fire-breathing Holy Ghost Pentecostal people. Somebody said hallelujah. hallelujah. Come on, wave your hand at me. I want you right now to look at your neighbor and smile at them and say this to them. Say, you must be a genius because you decided to sit next to me. You must be a genius. Now you're not, you know, there's not enough attitude in that. You need a little more help. So here it comes. Say, this is the anointed spot of the whole church right here. This is where the glory is. And you must be a genius to sit here because you're right next to the power. Now clap your hands and give God a shout of glory. I'm about to give you two words. Explosive words. Powerful words. Words that are earth-shaking and world-changing. And I want you to get ready for them right now. Won't you? How many of you wore your shouting clothes today? Did you? Can you shout in what you're wearing? So, the words are, now Moses. Now Moses. Do you know that you could argue and make a case for the fact that Moses was the second most influential man who ever lived. Only Jesus was more influential than Moses. He gave us the Ten Commandments. Through him came the nation of Israel. Through him, two and a half million slaves were disgorged from Egypt and built a mighty nation. You could say that Moses is probably, if there were no Christ, he would be regarded in history as the most influential human being who ever lived. But he didn't begin his career till he was 80 years old. How many of you, is that encouraging to you? I'm gonna try again. How many of you, is that encouraging to you? Some of you are waiting and training, and when you turn 80, it's all going to kick into place. Now, nobody in this room is old. I had a young man at the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry come up and act like I was old. Big mistake. I'm holding a clipboard, and he walks up to me, and he says, give me your mantle. I hit him in the head with the clip. I said, go get your own mantle. I'm not half done with this one yet. If your children tell you you're old, rebel against them. How many of you know they rebelled against you? It's only fair to turn the tables on them. Mom, you're old. You can't do that anymore. That's when you fold up your walker and hit them in the head with it. So far, I've been very violent. You are not supposed to fade out, wear out. You're supposed to burn out in the power of the Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen. Now, when your children tell you you are old and they want to put you in a home, don't let them put you in. Look, you're not helping me enough. I'm looking for a new audience. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need some fire in here. Okay, I'm going to look. Don't let your children put you in a rest home. You are not supposed to sit in a wheelchair and gum applesauce at Leisure World. You're supposed to go out filled with the Holy Spirit. You know what? I'm going to tell the old people right now, start moving your arms and legs. Start moving your neck. Say in the name of Jesus, I don't have arthritis anymore. I've gotten over my lumbago, my bursitis, because I am a tongue-talking, Holy Ghost-filled, atomic nuclear warhead in the name of Jesus. I'm not half done. I'm just getting started. I'm going to go out full of the fire of God. 
The devil is defeated every day of my life. Now look, if you don't respond to the early stuff, you don't get the good stuff. Do you know that Moses began his career as the world's greatest has-been? Yeah. Burned out, finished, done. You know how you know you are finished? Is when the devil calls off his surveillance on you. Because early in his life, the devil heard that Moses was the deliverer of Israel. And he killed a man. And he ran for his life. And he spent 40 years running. He never really stopped running. He went from the promise that he would deliver the Jews from slavery to tending sheep. Look at that phrase. Now... Moses tended sheep. I'm going to say it again till you get revelation. Now Moses tended sheep. The devil didn't know what he was about to become. The devil had no idea. Moses' dream is dead. The DNA of vision is gone. He is nothing. Now I want you to hold that thought because I'm guilty of preaching this way. That image of the has-been Moses has got to flow in the air and now I'm going to go over here and tell you about Ezekiel. One day Ezekiel has the most bizarre supernatural experience perhaps of anyone who ever lived. He is picked up physically, carried to a strange land that is beyond anything that Steven Spielberg could have created. There's bones to the north, bones to the south, the east and the west, as far as the eye can see are dried up, bleached bones. And he says to Ezekiel, these bones are the hope of Israel. And it's gone. And then he said to Ezekiel, standing over the bones, son of man, this is Ezekiel 37, son of man, can these bones live? Now, he didn't answer right away. He thought about it for a while because he didn't know if maybe these bones were the bones of other prophets that didn't answer that question right. <laughs> and then he said the most powerful thing, and if you don't get this lesson, you will never understand me. He said to him, he said to God, only you know. Only you know. Put your hand over your heart. Say to God right now, only you know. Only you, know. you know what I'm talking about is your sickness, your unsaved loved ones, your future, everything that we look at that is utterly impossible. Now here's what we teach. You put your hand down. What we teach is you can have what you believe. You can have what you believe. Now let me tell you, Ezekiel said, I don't know if these bones can live. I don't have any faith for it. Moses is not even thinking about faith. He's standing there. And today's sermon has a title. Fire that needs no fuel. Fire that needs no fuel. Now watch me. The Bible tells us that Ezekiel stood there and God said to him, prophesy to these bones that they may live. Yeah. Now, our theology says that he's disqualified from doing that because he can't believe it. Mm -hmm. And we think that God will only order us to do things we have faith for. But here's what the word of God says. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. And as far as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts. You see, the most important Christian attribute, look at me, the most important Christian attribute, God help me to say this, the most important Christian attribute is obedience. Yeah. 
And if you think God is only going to ask you to do things you have faith for, if you think that God is only call you to do things that you can imagine, then you're out of your mind. He's going to do the things you cannot imagine. Somebody clap your hands and give God the glory. Now, we've got Moses floating over here, and now we've got Ezekiel floating over here, and yet a third image comes into your mind, and it's me. And it's the first day that I've come to the Berkeley campus. And they're burning the American flag every day. And nudity and marijuana are both legal. You're not going to get arrested if you're stoned and you take off all your clothes. Not in Berkeley. So now they are hating God. They renamed their biggest park, Ho Chi Minh Park, over the Viet Cong dictator. They hate America. They banned the city council saying the anthem. The national anthem. You can't play the national anthem. You can't say the Pledge of Allegiance. Here's Berkeley having an election between the left and the radical left. And there I am on campus looking to God to use me. So I tell God the way you reach this campus is simple. You study C.S. Lewis, Francis Schaeffer, G.K. Chesterton, all of the Christian apologists. You come with an ironclad argument to defend the gospel and you go on there. I had literature, had an overcoat, had pockets inside and all this literature in it. How to, how to convince people that Jesus was real. I sharpened my argument. I stood in the mirror. I recorded all my words and I defended it to the nth degree and I was ready. And I went down on campus at 11 o'clock at night and I'm in the Sproul Plaza in the darkness looking for a campus person to witness to, my first victim. <laughs> I wanted to start with something easy. I found a flower child. You know, how many of you know what a flower child is? See, the rest of you need help. They have one at the Smithsonian in a glass case. It has beads and a a headband made out of daisies and you push a button and it says far out. <laughs> and when, and I want you to look at me, and when I started to witness to what I thought was the safest individual in the world to witness to, and God had been warning me and warning me and warning me. He said, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. What if I told you that 72 hours from now, the prophecies of this city would instantly begin to be fulfilled? Yeah. Wave your hand at me right now. Come on, clap your hands, everybody. What if I told you? Now, I'm arguing with God. I'm witnessing to a flower child. Suddenly, I'm grabbed from behind by a six foot five muscle bound leftist radical who's decided to kill me. Put his hands on my throat and started choking the life out of me. One day I told this story and a little old lady in the front yelled out, did you die? Man, I said, that's a better testimony than what I had right there. So then I'm being choked to death. And when thumbs are on your esophagus, you can't breathe. So you don't pray out loud. You send violent thought prayers up to God. And I'm sending them up. <laughs> using the head jerk, see if I can help it elevate. I said, God, get me out of this. I need your help. And then God said, uh, you want help? I said, I need help. And I said, I'll do anything you say. And God said, anything? I go, pretty much. <laughs> then sarcastically, the Lord said, if you want that man to take his hands off of you, just tell him what C.S. Lewis said. I said, thanks a lot. And God said, if you want my help, here's what you need to do. Grab his hands, pull them off your throat, 
look at him, point at his eyes, and rebuke him in the name of my son, Jesus, and the power of God will get on him. Doesn't that sound good in church? Doesn't that sound easy in church, right? You're all going, praise God. I was like, no. I said, God, have you seen this dude? He's already mad. I do that and I'm dead. I'm dead now. So the power of God came on my body. And when I felt the power of God in my feet and then in the rest of my body, listen to me. I knew that moment on that my ministry to Berkeley was being born. It was being born in that moment when I felt the power of God. And I didn't, couldn't think anymore. I grabbed his hands and they came off. Dude was strong. And his hands are back and he backs up. And in the darkness, I look at him and I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I'm a man of God. I'm here in the will of God and you back off. And he did, but he still looked mad. <laughs> then he quit looking at me and he started gazing up behind me. Now he's six five. I'm not. But whatever he was looking at was taller than him by a lot. And I look in his eyes and I see anger turning into fear. And I'm staring at him and he's scared to death and he's backing off with that look and I ran. You didn't turn around to look. I have people ask me that all the time. Now, brother, why didn't you turn around and look at what's scaring him? And I said, dude, this is why white people die in the ghetto right here. You're not helping me enough. Listen, if you're from the inner city and you hear a pop, pop, you run. Am I right? Somebody help me preach right now. And then you get two blocks away behind a car and then you look. <laughs> Brother man is over here saying, Mabel, did you hear that noise? I wonder what that is. Let's go check it out. <laughs> All the way home, I ran. I didn't care if it was Godzilla, King Kong, I don't care. All I know is the angel of the Lord delivered me from certain death on the university campus. And I'm running, come on somebody help me. I'm running home. I'm running. I'm saying you, you and me, Jesus. You and me and the Holy Spirit. That's it. So we opened up Saturday Night of Miracles. The Lord said, I want you to print a piece of literature and put it out on the campus that says the lame walk, the blind see, and the deaf hear. On the most intellectual campus. So I said, Lord, I have faith for the deaf to walk and the blind to hear. It's this juxtaposition right here that I'm out there handing out, getting spit on, getting my literature grabbed. And we had a small core and I said, I want you to bring the worst, the lowest, the most diseased, get them to our meeting. First Saturday night of miracle, people showed up. Radicals tried to break up our meeting. There was a witch shooting curses at me right there. Like I'm preaching like. <laughs> Man, none of this you learn in Bible college. In the back of our chapel, two people, a man, a young man and young girl, carry an unconscious 18-year-old, 19-year-old kid, plop him on the couch we had in the back. Our building could seat 90 people. Because of the raw curiosity of the handbill, it was packed. They laid him on there, and what I didn't know is that he was unconscious because he had shot a mixture of heroin and LSD. And they put him into a coma. They took him to the Berkeley Free Clinic and they were afraid of being arrested. So they 
brought him to our meeting and laid him there and he's out. He's in a coma. Now, I had no worship team. I had no, I couldn't say sing it again because we hadn't sung it before. <laughs> there's no faith. There's no atmosphere. There is that Ezekiel moment where God said, can these bones live? Can you move in Berkeley? Can you do this? And I'm waiting, and it is utterly painful. And all of a sudden, this young man wakes up off the couch and charges to the front, falls on his knees, and blows my theology out of the water. And he's sobbing out loud. He says, I hate God. And he said, why in the blankety blank blank would God do this for me? And I'm sitting there and say, I didn't know you could cuss and be healed. I'm going to try this half over here because you don't look like mystified enough. I didn't know you could cuss and be healed. And there he was, our first convert, brought back from a coma Filled with the Holy Spirit. Somebody give God the glory. <laughs> Things are bad, folks. Our campuses are factories of atheism now. The curriculum your children are being force-fed now are designed patently to lead them away from God. We don't know what bathroom to use. Somebody help me right now. My generation put a man on the moon. Your generation put a man in the women's bathroom. And that's a fact. Guard the exits. The man of God might need to make a quick retreat right now. It looks bad. And you know what? By the what the, so many pastors are preaching right now, you think the gospel is irrelevant. You think revival is impossible. Well, let me wake you up to a fact. It was this bad in the 60s. Hello. How many of you remember? Don't admit it too loud, but just wave a little finger at me right now. It was this bad. We hated God. The cover of Time Magazine said God is dead. In 1964, ladies and gentlemen, 100,000 kids ran away from home. Then the Beatles arrived. The president was assassinated. Prayer was banned in school. And within 12 months, 1 million kids ran away from home. The Vietnam War was raging. We were fighting a war we didn't believe in. We were confiscated and told night and day. Modern education in the 60s was a joke. And let me tell you something. They hated God. They were on LSD. They had mass love-ins. I was at the Summer of Love in San Francisco when 60,000 kids are all stoned on drugs at one time. And if the AIDS virus had been there, they'd all been dead. And then God poured out his Holy Spirit on California. Now look, and then God poured out his Spirit on California. Now look, then God poured out his Spirit on California. Our group on the Berkeley campus grew quickly to 2,000. 17 Jewish atheists from the Bolt School of Law are born again. Formed their own group called the Lions of Judah. We have members of the Black Panther Party saved. We had members of the Oakland Police Department saved. And what the significance of it was is these two groups that were saved were in a gun battle. One of the most notorious gunfights that went on ever in the history of Oakland. For hours, 
large groups of people shooting at each other, like a war zone. And the men in one side of that battle and the men on the other are both born again in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody give God the glory. They stand on the stage together, weeping in each other's arms. Somebody help me. The answer to racism is Jesus Christ. Come on, the answer to racism is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The devil needs to be reminded of something. I'm going to spank him a little bit. You don't mind? I'm just going to take him to the woodshed for a second. When it looks like nobody wants God, when it looks like everybody's on drugs, when it looks like leftist radical insanity is going to take over the country, the Holy Spirit will come out of nowhere and do a mighty work in the youth culture. And the young people will turn to God in wreck. Look out, it's coming. I said, look out, it's coming. Look out, it's at the door. Somebody said amen. I used to own a little book that was about an inch thick and it had the paper is like you have in a phone book, real thin paper. And it was printed front and back. It was every outreach center between Mexico and the Canadian border on the West Coast. It included California, Oregon, and Washington. And it was every Christian pizza parlor, drop-in center, halfway house. Every young person, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl in the state of California was witness to during the Jesus movement. Then it spread to America where Jesus festivals broke out in Pennsylvania, in Maryland, in Florida, 72,000 in Texas Stadium until finally there were so much going on that on the cover of the magazine it showed a picture of Jesus and it said the Jesus movement. And it wasn't a name we gave it, it was a name that Time Magazine gave it. Every talk show had and featured an evangelist. You couldn't turn on The Tonight Show or Dick Cavett or any of these others and not listen to Billy Graham and Oral Roberts and Catherine Kuhlman being interviewed at least once a month. Now, when Christian television finally was launched and Christian evangelists were on television, 40 million people were watching preachers on American television. Hallelujah. Two Christian schools a day were opening in the United States. The other magazine said, Look Magazine, 25 million Americans were born again. Hallelujah. Lord, do it again. Let me hear you say, Lord, do it again. Come on, Lord, do it again. And give him, give him mighty praise right now. How many of you want it? Come on, how many of you want this? How many of you want this? Do you want it? Eighty years old. Burned out living in the Christian Witness Protection Program. <laughs> Devil says, demons come home. Moses is not going to do anything. He's safe. That's what he's saying right now about the American church. The devil's sitting up over America laughing at us. He said, they're nothing but a bunch of lukewarm, divided people. They're each other's neck. They gossip about each other. They can't even get together and organize a meeting without fighting. They're fussing. They're fighting. And Moses sat there. How many of you know when the only work you could find at the age of 80 is with your wife's daddy? 
you are a loser. <laughs> See, I, I'm technologically advanced. I use uh, props. <laughs> and one day, something happens. You need to look at me. Something happens. He's out there, and there's a bush. There's a bush, a dry desert bush. I live in Reno. I know about dried bushes. And you know when a dried bush catches on fire, it goes up like paper. It immediately burns. This one didn't. Moses, with his 80-year-old eyes, looked at it. And he said, I don't even see the wood being damaged by the flame." The flame is burning, but it's not using the wood for fuel. This is a fire that doesn't need fuel. Now, let me tell you something. The first law of thermodynamics is being violated right before his eyes. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! The first, look, I'm trying to control myself right here. The way you reach people according to uh, these individuals is church must be short, it must be quiet, and it must not be confronting. That's what they say at Fuller Theological Cemetery. <laughs> And the seeker model was born on that premise. It's got to be short. Keep it short. Keep it quiet. Why are you so loud? God is not deaf. Well, he's not nervous either. Don't say anything that will offend people. And that's how you attract people. Every one of those things are absolutely not true in America. Not true. How many of you have ever gone to a modern concert, right? And they're, they turn the volume to nosebleed. And they never stop the concert and ask, is this too loud for anyone? Are you, are you okay? And you're not, Americans don't like to be scared. Let me tell you, I want to ask my wife to stand right now. Would you greet my wife right here? This is my, my wife, Michelle. Man, do I love that woman. But let me tell you something. She likes roller coasters. So does my 30-year-old son. They like roller coasters. I don't. Nope. I believe in the verse that said, Lo, I am with thee. I stay low. <laughs> this theory that Americans want churches that are quiet and not scary. I don't want church. Don't scare me. <laughs> they make these roller coasters now that you have to sign a release. <laughs> if you don't come back alive, you hold us harmless. And they go up. There's a place in Sandusky, Ohio. Cedar Ridge, Cedar Point. They've got a ride now called the Widowmaker. I'm pretty sure they hang you under your armpits, take you up at 100 miles an hour, and then shake you. And when you go up, this eagle flies by and say, what the heck are you doing up there? No, honey, I said heck. Now, and then they drop you. And the more your molecules are scrambled, the longer the line to get on it. <laughs> 50 million Americans last summer rode roller coasters. Wow. 50 million. And then, keep it short. Why are you talking so long? I'm growing a beard out here. And I'm a woman. <laughs> Look. How many of you ever heard of Buffalo, New York? It's cold. 
It is stupid. It's colder than Neptune. <laughs> the polar bear in the, in the zoo in, died in Buffalo, New York. You know what it takes to kill a polar bear? It's like I'm cold. I can't. What? But in that tundra weather, the men go to a stadium to watch a football team that has never won a Super Bowl. Look at me. Never. And they take off their shirts. When they have enough beer, they wear hard hats and they have two tubes bringing the beer from two directions of their face. They'll make fun of you as a Pentecostal. They're painting their face blue. They take their shirt off and stand there so drunk they go, America's been waiting to see this abs. <laughs> Not one of them ever say, man, when is this going to be over? They pray, for, they pray for sudden death. They pray for overtime. Not one of them leaves and say, oh man, those seats are so hard I couldn't believe it. Yes. Or it was so cold. Or the coach is so arrogant he didn't even shake hands with me before I left. Come on, preach. Come on. It's a myth that Americans don't want something real. It's a myth that they want it quiet or short or unthreatening. The idea that church ought to be an approachable, predictable, reliable, safe zone is crazy. You know what? Down in Louisiana... In New Orleans, there was a French roll, a Danish roll that looked like the face of Mother Teresa. 25,000 Catholics walked through that bakery to look at a Danish. If you see a UFO, people will want, they go visit Area 51. They, they're looking for this. So here's the theory. The church ought to be like this. It ought to be predictable. It ought to be quiet. It ought to be short. It ought to not threaten people. It should be just the opposite. It should be like... Yeah. If you want to flood a church with teenagers, tell them it's illegal for them to go there. Don't you dare go to that church. You go in that church, I'm telling you. And then the second thing you never do is tell them that weird things are going on in that church. Because people be like, yeah? When, when's the next meeting? Now, I may be having fun so far. But now, but here we go. Moses saw the bush. It did not burn the wood. The flames are there, but they're not consuming the wood. So now, he says something amazing. But before I can tell you about that, I want you to listen to one more story. We have one floating here, one floating here, one floating here. We got a fifth one. Here it is. It's a short, bald guy, a little bit wide. And he decided to become a salesman because late one night, he ordered a set of DVDs on how to close the deal. And it made him believe he could get rich going door to door. So he decided on a product, vacuum cleaners. I'm going to sell them door to door in Brentwood, California, where the mansions are. He goes up to a mansion, grabs the big door knocker, and, and the door opens, and there's a butler saying, what do you want? He said, I want the master of the house. You can't bother the master right now. He's ready to leave. And out steps a man in a $3,000 suit who's the same guy on TV that he just bought the DVDs from. <laughs> and he looks at him and he says, would you like to buy a vacuum cleaner? He said, son, you know who I am, don't you? Yes, sir, I do. I'm here because I bought your close the deal thing. And he said, and you know you're doomed not to sell me a vacuum cleaner today, right? Yeah. He said, now you know when I do the DVDs, I always give a list. Reason number one, you're not going to sell me a vacuum cleaner. Is I am better at sales than you are. No matter what pitch you throw me, I'll neutralize it. 
Number two, I already own five of the world's best vacuum cleaner, so I don't need your product. Number three, I'm late. I'm going to make $100,000 talking to Fortune 500 CEOs in a lecture. I got to get in my jet and get there. And every minute I stand here, you're costing me way more money than that vacuum cleaner is worth. That man, that salesman, that famous on TV guy was a full 45 minutes late to his lecture. Walks in with a red face. He said, I am so sorry to keep you waiting, but I was buying a vacuum cleaner. He said, you know, I thought I knew everything there was about sales. I thought I knew everything there was about making a sale. But this young man taught me something. I stood there and he said to me, sir, I know I'm costing you money. I know that you know more about sales than I do. And I know that you already own five of the best vacuum cleaners in the world. But I want to ask you one question. Can any of your vacuum cleaners suck a bowling ball out of a closet from 12 feet away? <laughs> I looked at that machine. I looked at my jet and I, the words came out of my mouth. This I have got to see. Say it. This I have got to see. In verse 3, Moses looks at the bush that does not burn. And he said, I will turn now and see this great sight, why the bush is not consumed. Here's the American version. This I have got to see. It's time for the church to quit apologizing for the miracles of Jesus Christ. It's time for God to get a hold of us and let the miracles flow. Let the miracles flow. Come on, wave your hand at me. When a man is saved off of alcohol in one step instead of 12 and goes from a wife beater to a model husband, when the lame walk and the blind see and the deaf hear Society is going to say this, I have got to say. Amen. Amen. Clap your hands right now. Amen. Thank you for watching this content. I hope this was a blessing to you. If you're like me and you like to click on things, click on this, subscribe to our channel, and the content will come to you every time we post it. And remember, the best is yet to come.